Bible to Acts chapter 21. We're going to do a little bit of a walking tour today through uh, these chapters. Next week we're going to be finishing up our look in the book of Acts. Acts, uh, the key verse in the book of Acts, got it on the screen for you, is Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Herein uh, the Lord Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That mission that Jesus gave to those first disciples is the same mission that he's given to us to take the message of Jesus Christ. The key figure in the book of Acts is the Apostle Paul. There's many people that we read of who were involved in the gospel ministry, but following his uh, conversion, miraculously so, in Acts chapter 9, as he was bent on persecuting Christians. Paul uh, grows in the Lord and becomes a, uh, the key uh, evangelist uh, that we know of in the, in the Bible. He's attributed, uh, accredited with about 14 of the New Testament books written by him as he was led by the Spirit. And uh, he is, a, as it says in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, uh, Ananias, uh, being led by the Spirit of God, God says to Ananias, he said he wanted Paul to he wanted Ananias to go lay his hands on Paul that he might be, receive his sight. Paul had been blinded when the Lord appeared to him. God says to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And so Acts chapter 1 is verse 8, the key verse. Paul is the key character in the book of Acts. And then last week we considered some ministry lessons from Paul. Uh, the world's greatest missionary. This morning, we are going to take up, as I mentioned, in Acts chapter 21 to 25, where the message I've entitled, Onward to Jerusalem, Compelled by the Spirit, Paul Goes to Jerusalem. And uh, the key verse for unpacking this, uh, the next uh, slide, is uh, really found in chapter 20. In chapter 20 of Acts, Paul says, and now, and he's finishing up his third missionary journey, that last slide that was there just briefly, gave sort of a picture. <coughs> Can you just go back there a second? Uh, it's hard to, there we go. See the, the, the lines? Those are, uh, it's hard to distinguish the colors, but that's where Paul went, starting in Jerusalem, and he, and the distance would be from the Jerusalem all the way to the farthest point would be about 1,000 kilometers. So that's quite a far away that he went. He went on these three missionary journeys, and the first one, I think, was a couple of years. The second one was about three years in length, and the third one was just over three years. And then he'd come back to Jerusalem, touch base with the Jerusalem church, and then head back out. Well, this is where we catch up in Acts chapter 21 to 25, is at the end of his third missionary journey, and he says these words, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And so he's on mission. God has said, hey, you know, when you go, there's going to be a hard, hardship awaiting you. And Paul says, I don't care. Uh, I know what my calling is. And the Lord is going to give me strength to carry it on. And I want to tell as many people as I can about God's grace in my life and how to be reconciled to God and how it's through Christ. And so Paul is resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that's where I want to pick up in chapter 21. Um, and the first point that we uh, are going to look consider this morning is that tests come in a variety of different ways in our lives. Paul uh, has said, I am going to Jerusalem. I feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. But then you have other people who warn him not to go to Jerusalem. And we catch that in uh, chapter 21. So let's read verses 1 to 16 just to get ourselves into the text. Paul is saying farewell to the people of Ephesus. Uh, he's just told them that he feels this great burden from the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, which kind of actually reminds us of the Gospels, doesn't it? Paul is actually following in the footsteps of Christ. Remember what Jesus, it says Jesus set his face as flint to go to, to Jerusalem? And then when he got there, what was his reception? 
O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. Right? And so there's there's this Paul is actually following in the very pattern of Jesus. Jesus was compelled to go to Jerusalem and to go there to die up for us. And here's Paul feeling that same compulsion to go to the city where where everyone that goes in the name of the Lord actually ends up being persecuted. And yet here he is obedient to God's call. And so he tells these people in, uh, that, he's, that he had witnessed Christ to, who had become Christians. He's finishing off. Uh, he, he kneels on the beach. They're weeping and embracing and kissing him. They're upset because he had said to them, uh, it says in verse 38, what grieved them most with his statement that they would never see his face again when he said goodbye that time. And then it says, then they accompanied him to the ship. Now, after we had torn ourselves away from them, chapter 21, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patera. We found a ship uh, crossing over to Phoenicia. We went on board. Now, this would be a lot more great today if you guys, you and I did a Greek islands tour, wouldn't it? But it was not quite the same as it was for Paul. Uh, so I, when I was reading this, I'm like, ooh, my, Sue's always, Sue and I have always wanted to go to the Greek islands on a tour, but maybe not quite in this uh, fashion. Uh, after sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, we went and stayed with them for seven days. And then listen to this little uh, part of the verse here. Through the Spirit... They urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So there's a little bit of a tension in the text. Paul says in chapter 20, compelled by the Holy Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Then they bump into, the, and bump into these believers who, who say, the Holy Spirit has told us that there's going to be a lot of hardship for you in Jerusalem. We don't want you going there. And so then in verse 5, but when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city. There on the beach, we knelt to pray. Never be ashamed to pray in public, or say grace, or whatever. After saying goodbye to each other, we went on board the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre, and then we landed at Ptolemas, where we were greeted by the brothers, and we stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea. He's getting close to Jerusalem at this point. And we stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. And then we learn that he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we'd been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus, who, if you remember, he appeared earlier in the book of Acts, he had prophesied that there would be a famine in Jerusalem. And that came to pass, just as the Lord had said it was going to. This prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he proceeded to take Paul's belt, and then he tied his own hands and feet with it, and he said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, the we is beginning with Luke. He's, he's actually a physician who accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys and who's um, perhaps the one that was writing this down as well. So when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. But Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us, and brought us to the home of Mason, where we went to stay. He was a man from Cyprus, and he was one of the early disciples. And then the journey continues. Paul goes into Jerusalem. He, he gives a report of all that God had been doing, of the many people who become Christians. Then he hears some bad news, if you keep reading on the text. The bad news is, is uh, that the people of the city had been told that Paul had basically gone out of the world, was telling everyone to abandon the Jewish ways, that he was corrupting the minds of of the Jewish people that he was witnessing to, and so that Paul somehow needed to show that he was still a loyal Jew who was staying faithful to God. Paul took them at their, took their advice. He uh, took some men to uh, the temple to, uh, to, to, to offer some sacrifice and gifts, not sacrifice, but to offer some gifts. He brought gifts for the poor, but then a, a giant riot breaks out because some people from Asia, some Jews from Asia who are visiting Jerusalem, they see Paul, they assume that he had brought a Gentile into the, into the 
temple, the, the temple courts, which was punishable by death, in fact. They assumed that he'd done that, and then they stirred everyone up, and, they be, and then uh, this crowd attacks Paul and start trying to beat him to death. At that point, if you keep on reading in chapter 21, the Romans, <coughs> who were you know, in charge, uh, they noticed that there was a riot. A centurion and his soldiers go out, find Paul being beaten by the crowd, and arrest Paul. That takes us to the end of chapter 21. Uh, but we see that here Paul, just tying everything together, Paul feels compelled to go to Jerusalem. And everywhere he turns, the Holy Spirit himself is saying, Paul, when you go there, there's hardship awaiting you. Um, the, he hears from the believers. When they hear Paul say that, it breaks their hearts. And they're like, don't go. But Paul says, don't try to stop me. And then this prophet comes and says, Paul, just so you know, if, when you go to Jerusalem, if you go to Jerusalem, you're gonna, this is what's going to happen to you. But every time Paul says, you know what, I'm going to go anyway. And so the question, there's a question in the text is, is, is Paul just being really stubborn? <laughs> Um, could he have made another decision? Or is he, is he in tune with the Holy Spirit uh, and knows that this is God's plan for his life and that this is something that he has to do no matter what anyone else says? And it doesn't mean that the other people are wrong. So when the prophet says, this is what's going to happen to you, Paul says, I'm ready for that. The prophet never tells him not to go. Now the other believers, it says, the little interesting verse was that through the Spirit they urged him not to go. But the only conclusion I come out of that is, is they've been told, the very same message that Paul's been told, that Agathus has been told, and they don't want the guy that they, you know, look up to and admire and love, they don't want this happening to him. And so they, they say, hey, we don't really want that, this happening to you. But Paul continues to say, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and because I have a mission from God of declaring the grace of Jesus Christ and I'm going no matter what. And so when I, when I look at that, I guess the conclusion that I come to is that tests come in a variety of ways, don't they? Uh, you and I face tests and temptations. This is not a temptation, this is more of a test of will Paul stay true to the mission? He knows where he's supposed to go, he knows what he's supposed to do, and even those that love him the most are saying, we don't want, we don't want that to happen to you. But Paul keeps on saying, I'm going to go. I know what the cost is, and I'm willing to pay the price. Uh, my job is to, is to declare the grace of Jesus Christ, and I'm going no matter what. And so, so the point is, is when it, one of the points is, is test kind of very shape. And then we need spiritual discernment. And you know, we have, for discerning the will of God, we have prayer, we have the counsel of other Christians, we have the scriptures, and yet there needs to be a great sensitivity to say, OK, what, what, what is God telling me what to do? And, 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 and sometimes we hear divergent voices that say, the cost is too high. There's, gonna, there's a price to pay for that. But there's this, this staying on mission saying, you know what, I, I know what the cost is. And, and the goal, my goal is to follow Christ. And so just an interesting dynamic that happens in the text that I just wanted to bring to your, into, our, into our view is that, you know what, we, we need spiritual discernment, and we need to realize that, you know what, sometimes it's, it's our own Christian brothers and sisters that maybe sometimes are the ones that, that don't want us to do something, but when, but when we know we, we should really do it anyways. And it's just sort of trying to parse our way through that and figure it out. The next thing I want to look at is, uh, as Paul continues in the mission, is that chapter 22, if you can just imagine the scene, it'd be quite a wild scene. I mean, Paul went through a lot. If you read later on, he talks about all the persecution that he faced. But this crowd that is trying to kill him, um, Paul, once he's arrested, he speaks to the Roman centurion in the latter part of chapter 21. Who the, the Roman centurion assumes that Paul is an Egyptian who actually had been leading an insurrection of 4,000 men out of the wilderness. So they think they caught like the number one wanted guy. But Paul says, no, I'm not Egyptian. Actually, I'm a Jew from this incredible city called Tarsus. And, I actually, and I'm also, and then he, later on, he tells him he's a Roman citizen. But he, first off, he tells him that he's a Jew from Tarsus. And he asks for permission to speak to the crowd. And, and then the guy says, OK, fine talk to the crowd. And then in chapter 22, 
Paul begins to speak to the crowd in their language, the language of Aramaic and Hebrew, and he tells them, essentially, his story of how he became a follower of Jesus. And, and then he <coughs> concludes by not only telling them the story of how he became a follower of Jesus, he then finishes it with, and then, you know, God has sent me to preach to the Gentiles. That was the, the big flipping point in the text. It says, uh, the Lord said to me, go, in verse 21, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this, and then they raised their voices and they shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. You and I, are, well, I don't know if there's any Jewish people here, but I tell you, you and I are the Gentiles that Paul was sent to. And they thought that, you know what, telling Gentiles about how to be right with God was enough to have you killed. <laughs> you know, they, they hated the Gentiles at this point that much. A lot of it had to do with the Roman oppression over them uh, and their hatred of the Roman Empire. And yet, when, but Paul, Paul, uh, saw Paul said some controversial things sometimes that got people riled up, and this was, this was the hot button for them. And then at this point, Paul is carried away, uh, and uh, he's uh, taken to the barracks to be questioned, and I'll get to that in a moment. But just on that very important point, you know, Paul tells his story of how he became a Christian. You and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've made a commitment to follow Christ, you and I have a story to tell, don't we? Mm -hmm. Paul, you know, the, the, what was his whole goal in life? To testify to the grace of the Lord Jesus. Grace that he was a personal re recipient of. Where God took him from the man, that he, the, the man that he was, filled with hate for Christians, persecuting Christians, and then after an encounter with Christ, became the world's greatest missionary. And Paul says, my entire old life is to bring glory to Christ and to tell other people how to be reconciled to God and about how amazing Jesus is. And, and, and when you, you and I give our life to Christ, we now have a story to tell other people of how we came from darkness and sin and, and under ju God's judgment to being free and forgiven by God. That's why we learned a, a, a couple years ago, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with, it's right over there on the wall by Rob, but do this with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3.15. We have a story to tell of God's grace in our lives. Sometimes we, we think, well, what am I to tell people when, I, when it comes to talking about God? Well, tell, we tell our story three times in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 9, the, the, the conversion of Saul is recorded. Here in chapter 22, the conversion, Paul talks about how he became a Christian. Later on, when he's on trial before Festus, what does he talk about? He talks about how he became a follower of Jesus and the mission that God had given to him. And so we, we have a story to tell. It doesn't have to be, sometimes we hear some testimonies that are sort of just seem off the charts, wild to us about where people have come from and how God has radically transform their lives, but, and we're like, well, my story's not like that, so I, I can't talk about what God's done. No, that's foolishness. The amazing account of how God took us and saved us, lavished his mercy and grace upon us, that's part of telling others about Jesus. Side point, I want to show you a, a, a kind of a cool passage. Take a look at chapter 17 for a minute, verse 26 to 27. This, it's neat how the scriptures all interconnect together. Paul, when he is arrested, after the crowd is, uh, decides that he's not fit to live, the, the, the Roman centurions, they had a very interesting method of getting information. They just beat you till they told, you told them what they wanted. <laughs> and so they, they are stretching him out uh, so that they can beat him, uh, flog him, actually, it says, so that Paul can tell them what's going on. As they're in the process of stretching Paul out, Paul casually, maybe not, mentions that, by the way, do you know that I'm a Roman citizen? Well, this kind of freaked them out because it was a big deal to be a Roman citizen. Paul was a Roman citizen by the virtue that his father was from Tarsus. Paul was not born in Jerusalem. Uh, though Paul was a Pharisee, he was born, his father was a Pharisee, uh, and he became a Pharisee but born in the city of Tarsus, which was a favored Roman state, uh, a Roman city. And, ever, and, and it was also allowed by the uh, king, the, the Caesar, that anyone, any, even a Jew who was born in the city of Tarsus would be considered to be a Roman citizen. 
and you couldn't arrest uh, or, ch or beat or execute uh, a Roman citizen without them having a fair trial first. That was one of the, the huge rights that went with being a Roman citizen. So when they're about to beat Paul, Paul says, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen, they could get in huge trouble for doing this to a Roman citizen. So Paul pulls out the card, by the way, before you go through with this, you ought to know who I, I am, my full credentials. Now that ties in, this is where the neat thing about how the Bible all connects together, that ties into Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens, if we back up to his third missionary journey, He's in the city of Athens, and he notices that there's this altar there to an unknown God, and he says, you know, I want to actually explain to you this God that you don't know. He says, the God who made the world, verse 24, and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples built by hands, and he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives um, all men life and breath and everything else. And then verse 26, from one man... He, being God, made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. And then verse 27, God did this so that men and women would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. But verse 26 is, God has determined the time set for people and the exact places where they should live. So where you were born, the time in history that you're born, that's part, that's, God is sovereign over that. And so here we bounce up into chapter 22, and Paul was born where he was for an actual reason. It was no mistake that Paul was born in the city of Tarsus in the time he was born, because God actually, in his sovereign way, used Paul's being born in Tarsus to protect Paul at this very hour. Just as Paul's getting stretched out, God determined the times for people, the places that they're going to be born, and he does so for a reason. And here's Paul, born in Tarsus, actually for a reason, because when it comes to this moment, it, it saves him. And then later on, how is it that he, he has these multiple trials before the Roman officials? It all ties in with, with ultimately going back to where he was born and the citizenship that was his. So that's, that's kind of a cool feature of the text that God doesn't make mistakes, and the sovereignty of God and how He how that unfolds in people's lives. So we have a story to tell. God is sovereign. Uh, the next point that we have is uh, a very important point: is that Jesus is alive. Uh, we serve a risen Savior. When Paul is is before uh, those that are wishing to try him, when Paul was out preaching and proclaiming Christ, one of the, what was at the core of his teaching that Jesus is Lord. Jesus came on a mission to die for our sins. He gave his life as a, sub, as a substitute, taking the penalty that we deserve. But he died and rose again three days later. The proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus. And so Paul is on trial. Acts chapter 23. He, uh, the high priest is there. The Sanhedrin, the 70 ruling elders of, of, of Israel. They, and they weren't all one uniform group. They were made up of Pharisees and, and Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in miracles. They believed in the judgment to come. They believed in, in, in angels and they believed in demons. They believed in all those things. And, but the Sadducees were the, the skeptical crowd. They didn't, all they accepted was Moses, Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament and the, and the law. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. They didn't believe in, in the judgment to come. And so Paul, in the middle of his presentation to them, says, you know, it's because of my hope in the resurrection that I'm actually on trial. And, that, and immediately a huge fight breaks out. Uh, and they almost rip him in half, trying to get a piece of him. And Paul's taken out of there. But what is at the core of Paul's teaching? It ultimately has to do with Jesus and wh whether he is a risen savior or not. And Paul says, that's at the center of my hope, is that Jesus is Lord and that he is a living savior. Paul then appears later on before Felix in Acts chapter 24. Uh, he says in verse 21, have a look at chapter 24. Marching through Acts 21 to 25. He's on trial. He actually had to be taken down to Caesarea. Um, Paul, the, the Jews hated him so much that 40 men made a, a promise to God, which is kind of ironic that uh, they, were, they would assassinate Paul. They were going to come up with some 
pretext for moving Paul from the Roman prison to, to appear before the Jews. And there were 40 guys that were hiding and waiting for him to go by to kill him. Uh, Paul's sister, her, her son, hears about this. It's reported to the Roman in charge. And then Paul is escorted by about 270 Roman soldiers down to Caesarea. But the Jews come after him down there. Uh, and then Paul receives a, uh, there's another trial. They bring their own lawyer with them. Uh, the lawyer and them speak first, and Paul is allowed to defend himself. But again, he asserts that the reason that he's there is because of his hope in the resurrection. Is because he serves a risen Savior. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of a big deal, isn't it? In Acts chapter 1, we are told that uh, Jesus gave many convincing proofs that he had risen from the dead. Standing at the center of our faith is two key tenets. Jesus is God in the flesh, and that Jesus is rose from the dead. And Jesus actually spent time trying to prove and convince his disciples before he left that indeed he had risen from the dead. There's the, the evidence of the empty tomb, the cover-up that the Jews and Romans um, tried to do as it regarded uh, that empty tomb. He, but the tomb had been guarded by 16 Roman soldiers. The disciples were fearful. So how could the disciples steal Christ's body like some people like to suggest? No, it was a miracle of God. Uh, the disciples went from cowards to dying for Jesus. There's many reasons to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It's at the center of our faith. 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus did not rise and our faith is in vain. Uh, Jesus rising from the dead um, validates all his claims and ultimately necessitates that we follow him. But here is, uh, again in verse 21, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. Paul's preaching had everything to do with Jesus is alive and we serve a risen Savior. And that's what we celebrate as Christians. That's why we're here today. Ultimately, it's everything to do with Jesus, his lordship and the fact that, that he is alive at the right hand of the Father. And that one day he said, just as, as it says in the text, as he went, he will return. And in the meantime, you and I are to become faithful to Christ. And then the last point I want to finish off is, as Paul is before... Um, He's on trial, and he's actually uh, going really up the line. He's arrested in Jerusalem, transferred to Caesarea. Then he, because the Jews again made this plan where they wanted him shipped back again from Caesarea to Jerusalem, Paul appeals to Caesar. I appeal to Caesar. And so Paul spends two years in jail. He was allowed privileges while he was in jail, so he wasn't treated harshly. The Roman governor... Uh, allowed Paul's friends to bring him food and clothing and supply his needs. He had some um, other limited privileges, so he wasn't treated badly as a prisoner. And yet, nonetheless, for two years he's in jail, in the governor's uh, jail. That's, that's in Caesarea. And while there, he has many opportunities to talk to the Roman governors and, and the officials. All fulfilling, by the way, a prophecy from the scripture earlier when it comes to Paul's calling. God's plan right from the very beginning was that this was his will for Paul's life, that Paul would testify of the grace of Christ, not only to the Gentiles, but to the kings and rulers of the Roman Empire. And so, and Paul, why, did he, why was he so insistent on going back to Jerusalem? Because he wanted to see God's will done. And he, and he knew what, was, what, what God had for him, and he knew what the cost was, but he was all about testifying about Jesus Christ. But here he is before Felix, and this is a neat passage. Um, if, you, if you didn't get a chance to read it before, read it later on today. There is this Roman governor, and verse, um, start at verse 22, just, uh, just for fun as we, as we get ready to finish today. Then Felix who was well acquainted with the way. I mentioned the other week that uh, before we were called Christians, we were actually called followers of the way, the way of Jesus Christ. Um, Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. He said, when Lysias, the commander, who was in charge of um, the, uh, the Romans in Jerusalem, when Lysias, the commander, comes, I will decide your case. And so he ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom, and to permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. And so he sent for Paul, and he listened to him as he spoke about, what's Paul talking about? 
Is Paul afraid of anybody? He doesn't care who you are. Right? He knows that you need one thing. The one thing you need is to hear about Jesus Christ and how to be right with God. And so he doesn't, he's, he doesn't care whether you're someone that's on the street or you're the Roman king or you have power over his life or not. There's one burning thing in Paul's mind is, is you need to hear about Jesus Christ and how to be reconciled to God. And so the, he, and he spoke to him about faith in, in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on three things, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. And he said, that's enough for now, you may leave. That's a very fascinating thing there, right? Paul's going full bore. Uh, maybe he was still in chains. Maybe they took the chains off when he went to see him. I don't know. But he's got something in mind that he wants to talk about. He wants to talk about Jesus. Wherever, or who, with whoever he can talk to G, about Jesus about. Um, Felix is afraid and says, that's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. And here we have this little postscript. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and so he sent for him frequently and talked to him. I don't know where he thinks Paul's getting money. Uh, however, what's strange, what's, the ironic thing is, is what do you think happened every time that Paul showed up before him? Right? Back to that same subject. Hey, it's another time for me to talk about Jesus to you. And, and the interesting thing is, is Felix keeps calling him back, right? What a testimony that Paul had that, that God set it all up. What's Paul required to do? Just stay faithful. God's going to open those doors. Paul just have to, has to stay on mission and stay faithful. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. And so his... The window is, is of hearing the gospel is closed, and so there's someone else that's going to hear about Jesus while Paul's a prisoner. But I want to draw your attention to those little words in uh, chapter, chapter 24. What did Paul talk about? He was talking about the necessity of faith in Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what ultimately is needed for every person. To be right with God, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Paul also talked about the big subject of righteousness. We are called it's a righteous living. We are called to follow after God and His ways. There's to be integrity in our life. There's to be purity. There's holiness. There's also a problem, and I'm sure Paul covered this off in his many conversations. While we're called to righteous living, on our own, we can't be righteous. The Bible says that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. That we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That would have been Paul's message on the, when he discoursed on the subject of righteousness. This is God's call, but by the way, I have bad news for you. You're not able of your own to be righteous. And then he would have told them the good news. That's why God sent Jesus. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Jesus came down on a rescue mission to save us from our sins, took the penalty that we deserve. And in Christ, here's the best news, when God sees you, he sees you in Christ. And so he sees you with the righteousness of Jesus applied to you. And so that's what Paul would have talked about when he discoursed on righteousness. He also talked about self-control. Now, we could go a whole sermon on this, couldn't we? I need more self-control. And I bet you could probably say the same thing. And so a good little reminder, as I thought about this, a good little reminder to me, probably a good little reminder to all of us, I need to keep on pursuing after righteousness and holiness. I also need to, I'm also reminded that I need to be a person of self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. But self-control is so important for us as believers not to let our passions run wild and our appetites run wild and unchecked. We are to be people who are filled and led by the Holy Spirit. And then Paul also talked about something, and this is why it says Felix was afraid, because Paul talked about the judgment to come. There is a day of judgment. There is a day of accounting for the lives that we live. It is appointed unto a man who wants to live and then to appear before the judgment seat. We're going to appear before Christ to give an account. Uh, and, and this day that the world mocks, it's coming, as the scripture says. It's been prophesied it's throughout the Old Testament. It's still part of the message of the New Testament. And, it's, and, and we see it featured in Paul, like I said, wasn't afraid of anybody. You need to have faith in Christ. You need the righteousness of Jesus. You need to be a person of self-control. And by the way, we're held accountable for the way that we live our lives. A day of accounting is coming when we'll appear before the judgment seat of Christ 
there's heaven and there's hell. There's a way to be forgiven and, 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 and reconciled to God. And, 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 and that upset him, but, it, but amazingly, he still kept calling him back because he wanted to hear from this man uh, who, who was telling him these things. And so, when you and I think about this, one great little verse just before we close, Romans 8, verse 1. When we think about the subject of the judgment to come, a favorite verse of mine is uh, Romans 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You and I are not afraid of the judgment to come because our sins have been forgiven, washed away, we've been cleansed. God sees us in Christ, the righteousness of Jesus applied to us. And so we have no fear. And yet we do have a message of warning people uh, of, of the reality of judgment while, while pointing to them at the very same time the incredible mercy of, and grace of Christ. That's why Paul says, you know, I want to testify to the grace of Jesus Christ who takes away people's sins and forgives them and puts them in, in right standing with God. Let's sing as we close. Uh, yeah, you'll recognize this song. It's a wonderful, uplifting song, Up From The Grave, Heroes.